All right, man, and we are back. Episode number 14 or 15 or something like that. Doesn't really matter, but all that matters is that we're here. We are here right now, man. It is a beautiful day out. It's not too cool, not too warm. It's just perfect t-shirt weather, man. It's just phenomenal. Looking out the window right now with the greeneries. Oh, man, these. this is what life's all about, man. Days like these. I hope you're all doing well, and I hope you guys enjoyed the 1956 video. That was a lot of work to do, as always, but the accomplishments and the end of getting in the rewards from the hard work, it makes it all worth it. And I see that. It kind of blew me away. Uh, it's been up for less than a week and already has 85 views, and that is just truly wild to me, man. I, I don't make these sort of uh, episodes for any, any sort of... Uh, um, I'm basically, I just make them to put them out there, and if people find them, they find them. If not, that's all right, man. These aren't the priority in my life, but the fact that so many people have clicked on it, even though I know, you know, 85 people have not listened to the end, that's a okay, man. It's, it's about oh, it's over an hour, so I understand people's schedules are different, but the fact that people clicked on it is, is truly uh, uh, extremely kind, and I appreciate all of you taking the time to at least give an attempt to check it out, um, however far you made it in. Um, because, man, I tell you, 1956 had some just truly phenomenal films that year. I, I look at my top ten, and I'm confident in all ten of them of just being great films, some more well-known than others. But, I mean, I tell you, it, it, some of those films on that list, like, well, I won't say right now because it's still a pretty new video, but uh, there's just a couple of gems on that list that I, I discovered that really kind of made the whole thing worth it. And um, at the end of that, if, if uh, you don't want to listen to through the end of that, I did pull another year, and the year was 2018. So uh, I've already watched three films there, and all three have been good. So I think we're in for a really good year that year. Um, man, there's a lot of films. The, the problem with the, the issue with doing newer years is that there are so many more films that, that have come out that it's, it's impossible to see them all in the span of time that I give myself. Um, unless I just devoted an entire year to watching everything, which would be truly madness because the amount of films I need to watch is just unfathomable that I can't solely devote my time to one year. And um, there's some films that, so I, whenever I pull a year, I make a, a complete list, and that's the list that I pull from. Uh, and when it comes to a year like 2018, the fact there are so many films, there are some that I have to just intentionally omit that I know that I, even if I like a lot, I just know for a fact that it will not make the list. So, um I mean, the criteria of when it comes to what films get on the list, I've said before, is that it has to have been seen publicly outside of a festival that year. So um, there was a couple films that were popping up on a couple lists of uh, the best films of that year or films, you know, just films in general that um, were not counted. Like You Were Never Really Here by Lynn Ramsey is a film I'm a big fan of, but um, that's, to me, considered a 2017 film, and I saw that on a couple lists. So that will not be on the list, but definitely most likely would have been in the top 10 because I'm a big fan of that film and I've seen it two or three times now. Um, Lynn Ramsey is just such an interesting filmmaker. T two of her films I have not watched yet that I own are Rat Catcher and Morvern Keller. Uh, I've heard just nothing but great things about either of those, so I just can't wait to watch those, man. Those are, uh, I think she's such an interesting filmmaker. Um, but yeah, I mean, 2018, is, it's going to be a lot of fun. I've, it's just that I've already seen three films and they're all good, so... It's, it's going to be a lot of fun, man. Um, but it's been great, you know, a after spending so much time in 1956 to go uh, to, to finally go out and uh, see other films. It's, it's, been, it's been so much fun because uh, at the last couple of weeks of a list, I usually spend watching nothing but exclusively that year so I can get into everything I want to watch. And, uh, you know, but when, when the episode's up, and it's out, and I have a new year. I can spend those next couple months just just watching what I need to watch, man. It's, it's fantastic. And uh, I tell you, I recorded that last episode, and I immediately just started working on the 56 episode. And the fact that I got it out that day, I think it actually came out a little after midnight. Cause I, I went to the cinema and then saved, you know, was exporting the video and came back, uh, uploaded it. It was just truly insane, and I can't imagine that is going to happen for any of my other lists. Um that was kind of a, an exception, but either way, it was a lot of work pulling clips, counting my thoughts, editing it, but 
you can't reap the benefits if you don't put in the work. You got to put in the hard work, man. You got to stay focused. You got to you got to really just uh, uh, stay true to your craft because if you do, man, at the end of that light, at the end of that tunnel, you're going to see that light and it's going to make it all worth it, man. Going into the film of the day, possibly two films because, man, this week has been, like I was saying, coming back from 1956 and watching other films now, there have been some truly terrific films that I've come across this week. There are two films in particular that I want to talk about. Whether or not I look at both of them remains to be seen. Um, and I was wondering which film I wanted to primarily focus on first. And I, I was going to, eventually I decided to go with a film that I have, I watched recently. I watched, um, gosh, at the time of recording this, a little over 12 hours ago, maybe 13, 14 hours ago. Um, I have no idea if this is considered this year or last year. I mean, I guess right now on Letterbox, Letterbox, it's considered 2021, but uh, I think it just got released this year um, to the public, but I could be wrong about that. A film that's actually been out for about a month or so, theatrically in some cinemas, but just came to video on demand this, not this past week, but the week beforehand, on a Tuesday, weirdly enough. I, I haven't heard of films coming out on Tuesdays, but had to check it out. One of my most anticipated films of the year so far, and that is from one of my favorite filmmakers, Gaspar No. This is Vortex, starring the great Dario Argento and Francois Lebrun. Uh, and man, and also it has Alex Lutz. It's primarily three actors and who take up the film. And um, this is a film, like most of Gaspar's films, that would be benefited of seeing theatrically. I've, I've, uh, only seen his film climax theatrically and that was truly a a, a a religious experience if I've ever been to if I've ever seen one it was such a incredible theatrical film and I've since watched that at home and it's, it's a great film at home as well but uh, there's something about the way he just totally encompasses the audience and forces you to be in this time and place that is cruelly the work of a master and the work of a master is evident here um, Without getting too much into the plot, Vortex is a very simple plot where you have this elderly couple, Lou and Elle, played by, of course, I said, Dario Argento and Francois Lebrun, um, who are going through a very bad patch. Uh, Elle is having severe memory loss. She is, she is seemingly not aware of where she is most of the time. And Lou, maybe it was Lee, I don't actually remember. Uh, I apologize. Um, he is trying to focus on writing this book, but he is starting to have heart problems. And their son, Stefan, played by Alex Lutz, is coming in with his son, Kiki, and um, the problems that, that come through. And um, the thing that was talked about with this film is the way it's presented, which you'll hear everybody talk about, is that the film is presented in split screen. So you have two screens going on at the same time. I don't know exactly what the aspect ratio is. But it doesn't entirely fill up the screen, which is interesting. I, I'm not exactly sure the way it was shot. I'm pretty bad when it comes to aspect ratios and different kinds of uh, uh, how films are shot, digital versus video. I mean, um, I'm sorry, digital versus film. I couldn't tell you. Some people smarter, people smarter than me could tell you, as I almost dropped the microphone. But the way that it's shot here is that it takes up most of the screen in a very interesting way. And let me get another sip of coffee. Hmm. Still hot, but still delicious, man, I tell you. It makes for a very interesting experience because um, when you're watching the film, you, it's, you're you focusing on two different sequences happening at once, and sometimes the camera is moving in both those sequences. So um, sometimes it is purely for aesthetic reasons, where you have characters who are in, specifically in frame with one another, or you have times where characters are doing two completely different things and you're focusing on that, as well as for non-French speakers like myself, you're also watch, you're also uh, reading subtitles, so you're really looking at three things at once, and you think that it would be a disorienting experience, but it's actually not. It actually works very well and takes no time to adjust to, um, because what I love about the film is that what I love about all of Gaspar's films is that he does a different, um, he has different filmmaking techniques for each of his films. I'm talking about his six primary features, not any of his shorts or his music videos, or recently his short he did, Lux Eterna, that I've been hearing some great things about, but I have not seen yet. I actually just ordered the Yellow Veil Blu ray, so I should be getting that in within the month, but that film is 
only about 50 minutes, I believe. But what's interesting about all six of his works, his feature works, is that they all introduce something unique and different in a way that doesn't that's not a, that doesn't feel like a gimmick, but actually adds to the story. Because at the very beginning of this film, and I should go, I should go to say, I'm not going to give any spoilers or anything like that. Even though it's not a film about the plot, but if you're worried about giving away too much, I'll, I'm not going to give away too much. So just just know that if you're trying to avoid anything about it. Um, What's interesting is that we have that uh, first sequence early on where it's just the two of them drinking a glass of wine together outside. And and uh, it's very brief, very, uh, it's a moment like that you wouldn't normally uh, think about too much. It's sort of like a nice little moment together. And then what's interesting is that we watch the film become split screen. I forgot the sounds of my phone. How embarrassing of me. I apologize, guys. All right. Uh, we see the split screen where Elle puts her hand on Lou's arm. And what's interesting is that the screen goes behind her arm. So it's sort of like we have that first sequence of their last true time together before everything starts going downhill. And when the screen is split, it's her realizing it, her realizing that she's drifting away and her doing what she can to hold on, but nothing can stop it, man. And from there we get, no matter, even if they're in the same literal frame, they're always going to be separated for the time they have left. And it's such an interesting technique, man. And it works so well. I mean, the film could have worked. I mean, the thing with the film, I think it could have worked as one frame. But what's interesting is that there's sequences in the film where you have, you know, Elle is being is 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 being a lot to deal with. She's just it's, it's very tragic what happens, you know, what she's going through. And, and when they send her away to, to be on her own for a bit while characters are talking, while Lou has to talk with Stefan, you know, in, in our real life or in any other film, we just send them off and we don't think about it because we don't want to think about it. But what Noah does is he makes us confront this uncomfortable dementia that she's going through or she, they send her off but the camera follows her. So we watch her and even if we're not thinking about it, even if we're focusing, focusing on a conversation between other characters, she's just wandering around the house and just she does things like she'll just turn on a light in the room and leave and and come back and turn off the light just strange things that you can't you know that we can't totally explain it's a very confrontational film like all of no's work what no does as a filmmaker is he takes very uncomfortable very um um uh, very uh, t uh the topics that we don't want to think about or don't want to um really uh confront and he makes us look at him you, you know and all of his work really man i mean the thing is that to me he doesn't have a if, when it comes to his feature films all six films of his are good even my least favorite film of his love from 2015 i still think is actually a cool film man um it's not a film that i intend to go back to a whole lot because you know i mean i that's a film that i have a lot of problems with in terms of some of the writing and some of the melodrama that doesn't quite work for me um there is a lot of isolated sequences in that film and the way that it's shot is very interesting um all the performances in the film are, are really are really solid. I mean, it, it's a little difficult to gauge when it comes to a foreign film how well they're doing, but there are times when you can see um, the. I mean, Francois actually she she has a good amount to do, and especially in the second half when we when she there's a lot of there's a lot of long sequences where, without dialogue with her but we just see her her eyes looking around that confusion on her face without you know without getting big and emotional like a Hollywood film would do where a Hollywood film would have this big sequence where she has to she would have to break down crying and have this big speech which would be so um which would be such a betrayal of of um the what the film sets up but we have um she, uh, uh, Lou, uh Dario in the film who is really uh, holding a lot of the film up. And I, I have no idea how uh, Gaspar was able to get Dario to be the lead character in the film, but he's fantastic in the film, man. A lot of his mannerisms and a lot of his, a lot of his tics, there's a point where he becomes very distressed and, and at a situation that happens about halfway through and we just see... Um, it, we we can hear it in his voice the weakness and of just of just a character who is trying everything he can to really stay afloat but above you know him trying to write this book and his own physical health and his wife's realizing that his wife is not is just going to get worse and worse it's so 
such a strong performance in the film. And, and man, I tell you, God bless Dario, man, because this is a guy who is, is living life to the complete fullest. He is somebody who is in, what, his 80s now, man? And he's acting in a film. He just had a new film release. I mean, gosh, man, it's, it's, he's truly one of the most inspirational artists you can look to, a guy who does not stop working. I mean, in terms of what he's putting out there, man, because even if projects don't always get off the ground, I know there was that whole issue with this Sandman film that never got made. Um, there was the whole like, like Kickstarter and go about that, but you know, people, you know, it, it's, and the, with the thing with Dario too, is that, and I'm going to, there's a little bit of a, uh, a side thing is that people want to say that, um, that they don't think that his quality of work after opera is up to par. And you know, that goes without saying for a lot of filmmakers. I mean, at a certain point when you're getting older, you know, we can't all be Scorsese and just keep making these phenomenal films even into our late age. We can't make a, a film like The Irishman in our late age where I still hold very true. That's one of the strongest films in his, his already incredible filmography. I think The Irishman is is, is a flat-out masterpiece. But, you know, to here nor there, whether you like it or not, my point is that he's still working. And with Dario's stuff, I mean, his films after opera, I think, are still interesting. I, I haven't seen all of them. I think the only ones of his I haven't seen are um, Trauma, Do You Like Hitchcock, Giallo, uh, Mother of Tears, Dracula, and actually Dark Glasses. So maybe, okay, maybe his <laughs> maybe his super, super recent stuff is, is rough. I mean, I, I mean, you know, but I'm talking about when people say after opera. I mean, there's there's films of his, like, you know, I think Stendhal has a lot of really cool ideas in it. I think that's actually a good film. Phantom of the Opera has cool ideas. Um, uh, Sleepless is actually a pretty cool movie. I, I think that's a pretty interesting movie. Uh, probably his strongest post-opera. And the card player is completely silly and completely ridiculous, but I think actually has, it's got a weird charm to it that is, is very silly, but I actually kind of like that film. It's, that whole sequence at the end of like train tracks makes me laugh because it's so silly, but it's, it's got a, it's got a charm that I respect. And both of his Masters of Horror, I actually like quite a bit. Pelts and Jennifer. So, okay, I haven't seen, and I haven't seen Dark Glasses yet, but I've been hearing some so-so things about it. But the fact he's still doing it, I mean, it, it, God bless him, man. He's, and he's still just going out there and doing the work. And um, the thing is that the film, what I love is that, you know, I, I you know a couple years ago when, uh, I think it was after, I don't know if it was right before or right after Climax, um, I think it was right after, honestly, right before, I, I'm sorry, not right after, I think it was right before he made this film that Gaspar had suffered a brain hemorrhage and it was uh, almost fatal and um, recovered from it. And the thing with this film is that of all six of his features, this one feels the most, uh, it feels the most personal. It feels the most, um, uh, we are not, uh, we're not as much on the outside where it feels much more of a, I don't even want to say a character-driven film, because even though it is that, I don't want to discard his other films, because even though his other films are experiences, there is that, maybe besides Climax, I think those are, uh, his other five films are, are very character-specific. I mean, Climax has that too, but that's less, but Climax, to me, is more about the experience and about being with these characters, rather than getting any real kind of uh, emotional connection, I would say. And that's not, a, that's not a, a, a knock on the film at all. Climax is a very good film, but I'm just saying in terms of it's a different kind of film than his other work. Um, and this is too, but it still has that, a lot of those Gaspar qualities where um, the editing, where, uh, where, the, where the shot will cut to a complete, black for a second and cut back even if it's in the same frame um so it's not as if it's like cutting to a different scene it's just sometimes in the same frame and um and uh the soundtrack in the film is completely diegetic where all of the noise comes from what the characters are listening to and the way the camera moves there is that there is a weird kind of um camera editing uh touch that he does that i i can't quite explain it's like um artificial motion where it's, um, if you like, sometimes if you watch a video and it's like people will focus, like the camera will focus on one object or one person. So when the camera moves around, it has sort of a disorienting feel because it's focusing on that. I got that a couple times here. I don't know if that was intentional or purely just an editing trick. Um, but as well with that, um, the, the, um, so it has those no kind of touches, um, and obviously the credits, um, it has, I think the font as well is something that is the font he's used in like all of his films, to my knowledge, at least that, like the opening kind of, um, I don't know what kind of font it is, but, um, and especially the, the final shot as well, it's, it's the, the final shot, the final piece of camera work is straight up, you know, if anybody else had done it, I would have said, oh, that's, that's something that Gaspar Noah would have done, but the shot composition as well in the film is, is fan fan freaking tastic man because what he does that 
it, there are two types of shots that he will use. One is when you have the two simultaneous going on. We have characters who will meet up, or, or there's a whole great sequence early on where, where um, Elle leaves the house. I should also mention I gave so much talk to Dario, but Francois Lebrun is also a, a, just a great French actress, probably most known for being in films like The Mother and the Whore and uh, Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Uh, so she's great as well. I, I definitely want to put her aside. And Alex Lutz in the film, who I wasn't familiar with, um, he is great as, as well. But there are just some, fr there are, there's like some great standout shots in the film where you, where you, it's like a mirroring effect where there's one, there's uh, one shot in particular, well, I guess two shots, but it'd be one where you have, um, there's one shot where you have Francois, I'm sorry, not Francois, L in the, uh, in the foreground on the left and the right of the screen. And in frame A, you have Stefan who is in the background and then you have Lou in the right frame who is in the background and they mirror each other in a way where they're in the literal same scene but in the frame you're getting the entire image in such a unique way not to say the shots totally perfectly align because some one you know it, it, it's a little difficult to explain like a character will reach their hand over and it's not it's not like a literal reaching over it's like on one frame it looks bigger on the other frame it looks smaller but it works in, in getting all the characters into frame and then there's another sequence um, in, in a bit where you have in the in the foreground, Lou on the on the left, and um, Kiki in the in the background, who's playing at the table, and then on the other in the other frame, the other end of the table, you have Stefan in the background, you know, set against Kiki and L set against Lou. It's a little it's easier to see than explain, but the way that he does it, it's not just a gimmick, which is what's so great at the film. Um, which you can even see on the poster as well. If you look on the film, it's like you have so you have vortex, but the R in vortex is there in both, but it's not quite lined up. It it has that distancing effect, much in the same way that you have a film like Climax, where you have these long shots where you just want to get out of there, where you just you're in this nightmare scenario and you just can't leave. Or you have a film like Love, where you have all this unsimulated sex and you have this unhealthy relationship between these three people, um, where it becomes at a certain point, and that's also a non-linear film as well. But there comes a point in that film where there's so much uh, unsimulated sex that it becomes almost kind of nauseating in a way. And these these three people. Um, who are, I mean, primarily the, the lead in that film, whose name I actually just mentioned recently, uh, last week, I think I mentioned him, or two weeks ago when I mentioned seeing him in the film Watcher, and who's a, he's a great actor as well, he's been in a bunch of stuff, like The Neon Demon and uh, Nocturnal Animals and stuff, I, I forget his name, but um, where you just see the, the extra relationship in that film that's built primarily on sex and how just, that's... That's not a that's not a way to build a relationship. These people can't just build a relationship on that. We see the downfall of that, and uh, or a film like Irreversible, that's obviously shot, that's obviously done uh, in reverse order. So you have a first act of the film, which I got to say, I recently rewatched Irreversible on that just amazing indicator Blu-ray that got put out last year, and man, I tell you, Irreversible, oh my gosh, man, that film beyond held up. That is a honest to God masterpiece, man. What an amazing freaking film. But you have the first act of that film with such a specific nauseating amount of camera work and violence and assaults where you have all this car, you have all this uh, violence going on and this intensity and the camera is, is it's, it's totally all over the place in an intentional way to make you feel une feel uneasy. And then you have a, a horrible, uncomfortable assault scene with uh, the scene that people talk about in the film, and the camera st stays right there. It's like no matter what, man, you're gonna watch this, and you're gonna there is no going away from it. And it's not exploitive, and it's not gimmicky. It's Gaspar, is such a such a genius filmmaker that he that he confronts these uncomfortable parts and makes you focus on them no matter how much you don't want to and scenes linger on and um which if i mean if i had any real issue with vortex maybe the only real issue that i have is that it because it is very slow it, it's a very slow paced film and you really have to sit with it in fact this is a film that would be best suited theatrically not for any sort of visual spectacle but in terms of getting completely sucked into the film i mean when i in terms of uh, 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 you're in a you're in, you're watching a large screen in the complete dark now now when i watch all of my films no matter what they are it's in complete darkness or in the, as dark as i can i cover up the lights in the room uh, yeah, i put tape over them and uh black them out and i you know put my phone off to the side i don't play my phone because you, you, you gotta surrender yourself to film man but i think seeing this theatrically being more immersed in that um 
watching at home, you'll get that same experience. You'll get a good experience as well. But I, I, I it's, it's a thing where um, surrendering yourself to the film is totally. Is, you you just have to do it because I can't. I you can't be doing other things by watching this film, man. Even if there's not dialogue. Um, my, what I was saying before is my only real issue, not even so much an issue, is that because it is slow moving, it, it does, maybe, I think probably in the second half, feel a little, I don't want to say long because I don't think you'd really want to cut out a lot of this, but I do think that maybe there's a couple times where I was feeling the length a little bit, um, which isn't even really a complaint because if you ask me what to cut out of the film, I really couldn't tell you because it is, it, it's a very specific kind of feeling. I think maybe in the third act, there's a couple things that, maybe ling uh, uh that go on a little bit more than it needs to i will say though with the third act of the film where the film ends up i thought was so interesting because when you have essentially um you have uh kind of an epilogue in a way if, if you will where it cuts to a different thing i'm trying to be very vague about it so um i'll, I'll do my best not to say anything uh, uh that gives anything away but you have you cut to a different thing and i was like okay that's an interesting way to um to end the film and which I was like, okay, I don't know, you know, I think it would have had more of an impact if you ended it a little bit earlier. But then what it does is that it cuts to like the last 30 seconds of the film, what it then cuts to, uh, it was like one last, system, one last is gut punch where the, the final shots, literal shots of the film, I thought were so perfectly done in a way where it's like, man, that, that just sums, that just brings the entire film together. And, and there's so much, I, there's so much I want to talk about that, but obviously I don't want to get spoilers, man. But, um, gosh, man, I could, I really could talk about this film for about another hour. So I, I talked about it with a couple of acquaintances who, who had seen the film previously and were, um, just as ecstatic about it. And I just, I look at Gaspar's work and just how, how much he is such one of the most interesting filmmakers working, one of the best filmmakers working. I mean, you want to talk about a true, honest to God artist, man. Gaspar is that artist, and he's somebody who loves film as well. And respect. I mean, you can look at this film, and you know, because Argento, um, he, he's writing a book about film, and he's um, and, the, and his character is big into films. So you have all these great posters of these, you have like you know, films like Metropolis and Peeping Tom, and a woman is a woman, and you know, just a bunch of stuff like that. So it's just great to see, and even in Love, there's a part where kind of made me laugh you have the main character in that film that does cocaine off of the um Ruggiero Diodata book so he's a guy who loves film respect who you know obviously casting Dario in the film as well um he's, he's just such a genius man I think that he, he just uh, all six of his films he, just man I it's gonna be a very very sad day when we don't get any more work from Gaspar because the man is, a, is an honest to god genius and I think that what he does next is gonna be is gonna be an uh a, a, an undeniable signature film of his in terms of his style but will be I, I i am truly confident it'll also be different it'll also be something new and experimental and whether or not it works or doesn't work which most likely it will because even like i was saying before even with love which is my least favorite film of his, I, th I still think it's a good film but my god man we truly are we truly are blessed to be living at a point in time in history where we get to experience the great work of him and the great work of dario and um francois and it's just all these people together man I, I feel truly honored to be alive at this time in history to get to experience these great pieces of art so vortex is available to rent right now i rented it for about five bucks on amazon and um uh, i saw that utopia uh, put distributed the film so most likely we'll get a utopia blu-ray um and uh, I'm very interested to watch the making up on this film. I, I don't know how often I'm going to go back and rewatch it. It's, it's not really a film that um, I think I'm going to watch again and again. Not not for the content, but just because of, um, uh, unlike, it's, it's, unlike a film like, uh, maybe like Climax or something where I could go back and watch it again and again. Um, maybe not as often, but that's a film more about the, um, I would say the experience, but this is, too. It's, it's difficult to explain, to explain what I'm trying to say. And now I'm rambling like a madman. So if you're still listening this far, oh man, man, I thank you. But yeah, man, it's, it's a heavy film. It's a lot to take in, but it's one of the best films of not the, not only just the year, but of Gaspar's filmography and that's really saying something. But anyways, guys, I meant to talk about another film. Maybe I'll talk about it next week. Um, another terrific film that I watched this week. Uh, but that's okay, man. I uh, appreciate all of you guys who at least click on the video and maybe even listen to a little bit or maybe listen to all of it. Um, thank you a lot, man. I hope that, uh, you know, this turned you on to a great film to check out. And I hope you're all doing well working on your art, working on your craft, or just enjoying our daily life that we are so blessed to have. Because, gosh, man, after this past week of these great films, I... 
I really know I am. But uh, anyways, I'm going to sit here, drink the rest of my coffee, get some work done, and experience some more art later in the day. So um, what else do I got to say? Let's see. I got about less than a minute left. I don't have a whole lot to say. So you know what? I'm, gonna, I'm not going to waste your time. I'm going to end it right here. All the best, guys.